In late April 1951, a Chinese army marched six abreast towards a narrow point in the Kapyong Valley in Korea. There stood hundreds of Australians, Canadians and New Zealanders, facing 10,000 Chinese, intent on taking the capital city of Seoul. We were up against a real tough, clever enemy, and so many of them, so many of them. Had they broken through at Kapyong, it would have been a bloody disaster. And that could have turned the whole course of the war. The Chinese first hit the Australians. 600 men spread across a low hill. A similar number of Canadians on the next. There was a key battle that the Commonwealth Division fought in the whole Korean War. I think Kapyong should be studied as the perfect battle. Though the Battle of Kapyong remains largely unknown, those who were there cannot forget. The slaughter of the enemy was just unimaginable. It still gives me nightmare. If the Chinese army could not be stopped, a nuclear World War III was waiting in the wings. MacArthur had a great plan to drop 24, 25, 26 atomic bombs. Against this backdrop of nuclear genocide, Man fought against man for a hill. I'm 20 years old. Either. Am I going to see 21? This is the story of the Battle of Capion, a forgotten battle in a forgotten war. Just before Anzac Day, 1951, Australian soldiers arrive in a secluded valley after 10 months of heavy action. They're part of a United Nations force sent at the urging of the Americans to push back the communist North Koreans after their invasion of the democratic South. On Sunday, June 25th, communist forces attacked the Republic of Korea. Free nations must be on their guard more than ever before against this kind of sneak attack. 20 countries contributed to the UN force, nations as diverse as Ethiopia, Costa Rica and Turkey, as well as members of the British Commonwealth. Australian Prime Minister Robert Menzies sent his troops hoping to sweeten military ties with the US. The Australians found the fighting fierce. The UN has suffered a series of defeats, and by April of 1951, the 3rd Royal Australian Regiment have earned their break, 36 kilometres behind the front line. They camp near the village of Kapyong in a peaceful spot, which they christen Sherwood Forest. Well, for six months we've been fighting the war, constantly in action, constantly in contact with the enemy. We weren't expecting a rest, but we were moved to this lovely green valley with a creek flowing through the middle, and uh, we were able to put up two-man pup tents, which was a bit of a luxury, because on the move, you're sleeping out in the open uh, every night, rain, hail or shine. We had meals that were coming from a field kitchen, so they were served on plates. There were no duties to perform. We were completely at liberty to take a rest. Also relishing the rest is Second World War veteran and Australian commander, Lieutenant Colonel Bruce Ferguson. I really enjoyed the spell. We were scheduled to be there for a fortnight, and all the soldiers sat down once a day for a long bath and came home every night for a beer. Life was very relaxing and pleasant. At the centre of this idyllic retreat sits a purpose-built caravan, a command centre for Lieutenant Colonel Ferguson. It contains his maps, his radio and telephone. It had a heater, a bunk and a table. Cheers, cheers. <laughs> and he liked to dine with fresh flowers. And it was often the task of his junior officers to gather them for him. An anonymous digger, christened Ferguson's home on wheels, Pandora's box. We had this thing tagging along behind us all the way up to North Korea and all the way back again. He was extremely comfortable, and I suppose he deserved to be. 
but uh, Fergie wanted a caravan and he had one. As Anzac Day approaches, the Australians relax. They've organised a barbecue, they hoard their beer rations and plan to invite the Turks. But the peace of Sherwood Forest is about to be broken. Hello? The Australians are ordered to move up, to survey defensive positions should the South Koreans at the front be suddenly attacked. If they break, the Australians around Hill 504 now command a position overlooking the Kapyong Valley. Bergson explained to us that the Korean division was holding, but we were to recce a blocking position in case things went wrong. Once we'd done the recce, we could go back and get on with the rest. It's just, a, just a really a nothing thing. We dug slit trenches, set up our weapons, and uh, waited, waited to uh, see what happened. The Australians wait, dotted around a low hill named 504, on the eastern side of a narrow point in the Capyong Valley. Opposite them, another part of the Commonwealth Brigade the Princess Patricia's Canadian Light Infantry are digging in on a larger and steeper hill, 677. Both realise something has gone very wrong. Republic of Korea soldiers have been coming through our position. What have they experienced that has so terrified them? It was as though they were hypnotized they didn't see you they just had one objective run south uh, i've never seen such chaos or fear in my life the front has broken new zealand artillery sent forward to support the south koreans are now caught behind terrified refugees and fleeing soldiers they must get their prized 25 pound guns out no one can get in the way. They're trying to clamber on our trucks, but they told us, don't let anyone on the truck. They don't know who the hell they are. They could be infiltrators or what they are. But they had no weapons. And I mean, it's quite frightening. Despite the chaos of refugees and panic of fleeing soldiers, the New Zealanders somehow get their guns through. A distressed and terrorised population are streaming down the road. It takes pretty resolute, experienced soldiers to say, we're holding this ground, we're not joining that mob. The increasing numbers on the road make the Australian commander on Hill 504, Major Ben O'Dowd, nervous. He and his men are suddenly on the front line of a bloody conflict, which started just ten months earlier. In June 1950, when the communist North Koreans invaded, they aimed to reunite their country, divided along the 38th parallel by the Russians and the Americans after World War II. A United Nations resolution, triggered by the US, established a force to push the communists back. The UN commander is America's World War II hero, General Douglas MacArthur. MacArthur decides to tackle the North Koreans with soldiers based in occupied Japan. He expects a swift victory. The troops that the Americans initially sent across from Japan, they had been on garrison duties, they weren't well trained, they weren't fit, and they were pushed back rapidly along with the South Koreans. So virtually all of South Korea was overrun except for a tiny enclave at Pusan at the southeastern tip of South Korea. General Douglas MacArthur implements a bold plan. He stages a surprise beach landing at Seoul's port city of Incheon. 
and effectively cuts his enemy's advance in half. He did marshal an enormous invasion force that succeeded in retaking Seoul within a week uh, and cut off about 75,000 North Korean soldiers in the south. As soon as the Incheon landing uh, appeared to be successful, the idea of invading the north uh, was on the table and we went ahead and invaded North Korea, which turned into a complete debacle. The Australians, as part of the Commonwealth Brigade, push north. Six weeks after landing in Incheon, they are near the Yalu River, looking across the border into China. MacArthur had made the statement that the war was over and the troops would be home by Christmas. And uh, a month went by, a frozen month, you know. We were in trenches, facing north, with the cold wind from Manchuria blowing into your face so that you, you had to turn your head away from it even to be able to breathe the air. And we didn't really know what was going on. We, uh, uh, we just watched our front and, uh, and waited to see. The leader of Communist China, Mao Zedong, is increasingly nervous about activity on his border. China makes numerous public and international threats that it will enter the war, but MacArthur ignores them. 